Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Violence and hunger drive tens of thousands to squalid shelter in South Sudan. 15,000 came in just the latest wave. Tonight, the reasons behind the suffering. What can Canada do about South Sudan? What can you do? We bring in the experts for answers. Another concussion for Sid the Kid. Renewed questions about player safety. Plus, airline executives hammered for customer horrors. I never want to see a paying customer pulled off of a flight to move a crew. It is a horror show we've seen before, a violent struggle for power rooted in hatred, making cynical and sickening use of ancient ethnic conflict. Think Rwanda, Bosnia, Darfur, and any political solution encouraged by a late-to-notice international community is never soon enough for the innocent. You can now add South Sudan to the list, where a version of that hellish storyline is playing out in slow motion, out of control brutality by government fighters, sending tens of thousands to a shaky refuge. The filth of UN camps, like the one near Wow. That's where our Margaret Evans begins her latest account. Prison or sanctuary? It's hard to tell at a first glance, but these tattered way stations teetering on the edge of humanity are now the reality for a growing number of South Sudanese, as weary and as threadbare as the structures seeking to shelter them. More than 40,000 people are crammed into this camp protected by UN soldiers next to a town called Wau. The official name is a protection of civilians camp 15,000 came in just the latest wave. And they say they feel safer here than they do in their own homes. Urbana Wall rushed home to his family in mid-April when he heard that mainly Dinka government soldiers were taking revenge on Noor civilians after an opposition ambush. They are saying that we are supporting rebel. That is why they kill the civilian hours to hours. The shadow of loss rustles through every claustrophobic corner. Angelina Michael says soldiers in government uniforms burst into her home, shooting her brother dead as he came out of the shower. She left his body where it lay and fled with her children. There are an estimated 180,000 people now living in six POC camps across the country. The conflict taking on an increasingly ethnic tone and fanning fears of another Rwanda or Burundi. What is for sure is that uh, there are many people who have been killed because of their, uh, their, their ethnic uh, uh, affiliation or uh, along ethnic lines. The UN mission's Eugene Nindorera is just back from WOW. Atrocities on both sides, he says, but responsibility resting with the president, Salva Kiir. The majority of the violations are committed by uh, uh, the, the government forces. Families have also taken refuge on the grounds of WOW's old Catholic cathedral. Mary Aboke is 19, pregnant, and was beaten by soldiers with a rifle as her children hid under the bed. She says she wasn't raped, but that's a reality for many women, says her friend Arach. Children have been killed walking on the road, she says, women raped. Taban is a volunteer counselor. He says young men are the main targets in the killings. What they don't want to see is youths. When they see youths, they will not leave the youths. But women and children, they sometimes leave. There is no security outside of the camps, and so they are expanding to make room. Squalor and despair, the only things growing in a famine-stricken land where homes and crops have been abandoned, along with the horizon. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Wow, South Sudan. Margaret will have more stories from South Sudan in the days to come. 
Tomorrow, she looks at the lives of the most vulnerable, desperate mothers and their starving children. Then later, what a political solution might possibly look like. That's on the national and online at cbcnews.ca. So what is the Canadian government doing about the situation in South Sudan? And is it enough? The CBC's Katie Simpson has that story. The suffering is half a world away, but calls are getting louder here at home for Ottawa to do more to help. Ultimately, the only thing that will really allow South Sudanese to go home and resume their lives is peace. We need to see an end yes. to the conflict. Oxfam says Canada could play a bigger role in the ongoing United Nations peacekeeping mission. It's an idea worth the government's attention, according to Canada's ambassador to South Sudan. I certainly hope that uh, they'll give full consideration to uh, what Canada can do in South Sudan. Again, the UN mission there faces a lot of challenges, but I think it has a very important mandate. So I think that's a very important mission, it's something, something worth considering. Canada has 10 soldiers on the ground right now, and Alan Hamson says their work has impact. Canadian uh, officers' professionalism and training uh, can bring something valuable to UN peacekeeping, um, including in the UN mission in South Sudan. The Liberals have promised up to 600 soldiers and 150 police officers for general peacekeeping operations. It had been widely expected back in January that Ottawa would announce support for the UN mission in Mali. That decision appears to be on hold. Today, the International Development Minister didn't say if Cabinet is looking at South Sudan as an option, but she did say Canada is open to boosting famine financial aid. Right now, Canada is uh, one of the top three donors. Uh, we have been one of the first ones to give this year. We are following the situation very closely, and we may increase our contribution later. Canada has donated nearly $37 million for humanitarian aid in South Sudan so far this year. Some leaders in Canada's religious communities want Ottawa to contribute more and have written a multi-faith plea to the Prime Minister to raise international awareness about the crisis. Uh, this is an opportunity, I think, for Canada to speak out and stand tall. Oxfam agrees Canada should be pushing this issue on the world stage and says Justin Trudeau will have the opportunity to call on other world leaders to increase financial aid at the upcoming G7 summit later this month. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Coming up, the roots of the crisis in South Sudan and what could spur the world to action. Come from away. Plus, lots of nominations for Canada's Broadway baby. We visit the birthplace of Come From Away. As the Canadian Senate works to repair an image tainted by scandals, both political and sexual, a Senate committee is, for the first time, recommending a sitting member be expelled. Don Meredith is at the centre of one of those scandals, the result of his two-year affair with a teenage girl. Anna Thibodeau has more. The Ethics Committee says Don Meredith is unfit to serve as a senator. His presence in the Red Chamber would discredit the institution, and expulsion is the only way to go. In the eyes of the committee, Senator Meredith's misconduct is one of the most egregious breaches in the context of our role as senators. A report by the Senate ethics officer two months ago said those egregious breaches included initiating and encouraging a sexual relationship with a teenager knowing she was only 16, using his position of power to lure and attract the girl who was in a vulnerable position, and using Senate resources to foster the relationship. Looking at the resurrection. The 52-year-old Pentecostal preacher was appointed by Stephen Harper in 2010. Meredith has expressed regret to his wife and family for the harm he's caused. But the committee decided it couldn't show any leniency because they felt he was never repentant for his actions. I'm not sure that uh, this was the only solution. Meredith's lawyer had asked the committee to suspend the senator for one or two years without pay and is disappointed with the recommendation. He loses his, his livelihood, and that is very significant when we're talking about proportionate responses to mistakes that people made, no matter how serious they are. Meredith is expected to address his colleagues during the debate on the report, but these senators have already decided his fate.
are unforgiving when it comes to behavior that's not appropriate and not appropriate for a senator. So um, it is unfortunate for Senator Meredith, but he will have to face the consequences. My own personal opinion, I'm, I'm a father of a 14-year-old daughter. And I mean, all these things play on your mind. And, uh, you know, I mean, so a lot of things have to be taken into consideration. But to think that it's just a, you know, a regular day, it's not a regular day. The Senate will vote on the recommendation later this month. And if they choose to expel Meredith, it'll be the first time a senator has ever been kicked out of the red chamber. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Some U.S. lawmakers got an opportunity today that many frustrated flyers can only dream about. They summoned executives from major airlines and aired their grievances. As Paul Hunter tells us, it wasn't just high-profile incidents they questioned. They went after hidden fees, too. Hey, hey, come on. Put your, come on. Be it what happened on that United Airlines flight. Oh my God, look at what you did to him. You do that to me and I'll knock hey, you flat. You stay out of hey. Or not long after on the American Airlines jet. Come on, bring it, it was brutal. And as it turns out, maybe a game changer. We thank you for the opportunity to address the committee on this. Today, those who run United and American and two other major U.S. airlines came to Capitol Hill facing fury from lawmakers. And though the airlines began with apologies, this incident did not reflect the values of our company. Underlining changes they've now made from within. No customer, no individual should ever be treated the way Mr. Dow was, ever. And we understand that. What followed was a kind of smackdown over pretty much everything else. The stuff airlines do every day that irks countless. I've had the counter clerk be so hostile to the point where she says, don't ask me any more questions. From the very start. But we all expect it to be a miserable experience. Pretty soon you're going to charge for use the restrooms. Sir, whenever you do that. Lawmakers slammed the executives for complicated pricing, the size of seats, the cost of snacks, the long waits at every step, all of it. The change fees. Let's go to overbooking. We use overbooking to uh, take care of, of thousands of customers. For sure, the airline executives had answers to some of it. For example, the change fees help ensure flying is affordable. We have change fees. that They're about keeping our fares low. Uh, and as was referenced earlier today, you know, fares have declined 24% since in the last 20 years in real terms. But with industry profits in the many billions, all those add-ons found little support today. I would observe that United got $800 million in change fees last year. $800 million. That is a lot of money. Add it all up and lawmakers had a blunt message for the industry. Make flying simpler, easier, better for travelers or face federal regulations forcing them to shape up. Said one lawmaker, they won't like that. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. For the former South Carolina police officer who fired at a fleeing civilian and for the family of Walter Scott, the man he killed, it was a day of justice. The two men were on opposite sides of gunshots, infamously caught on cell phone video in 2015, then viewed by millions. Today, Michael Slager pleaded guilty to federal charges and faces a maximum of life in prison. The case was one of a number of shootings of African Americans by white officers that led to protests across the U.S. Another of those shootings involved the death of Alton Sterling during a Baton Rouge, Louisiana police takedown last year. There are reports out today about that case as well. Federal authorities have reportedly decided not to lay charges against two officers. A CBC News investigation has led to a scathing report tonight by Canada's prison watchdog. Matthew Hines died in federal prison nearly two years ago. Officials told his family staff had tried to save him. But when CBC News obtained a secret internal report, the truth came out. The guards had beaten and pepper sprayed him and then lied to his family. Angela McIver has the story. I felt like I had a hole in my heart and I, 
I couldn't breathe or anything. Almost two years later, Marg Hines still grieves her son's death, and she wants those responsible to pay. Today's report from the correctional investigator outlines how 33-year-old Matthew Hines pleaded with staff, begging for his life. After being punched and kneed, then pepper sprayed in the face five times, don't let them kill me, he was heard on video saying, don't let them end my life, I don't want to die. His family was told he died following a drug overdose. It was later revealed Heinz's cause of death appeared to be asphyxiation after his lungs filled with fluid due to the pepper spray. Correctional investigator Ivan Zinger also found 13 correctional officers were present, yet no one helped. Unfortunately, no one seemed to have taken um, uh, assumed leadership or uh, command of the situation. Zinger's report also cites how the nurse on staff stated she provided life-saving treatment when she did not. She is no longer working at the prison. But perhaps the most scathing finding is Zinger's description of what happened to Hines in the shower after he was pepper sprayed. He calls it the equivalent of waterboarding. Uh, they didn't take the uh, t-shirt off his head before they turned the water on. Uh, and you can only imagine the sensation that uh, he, he must have felt like he was drowning. Zinger says he's disturbed by a lack of transparency at Correctional Service Canada. His 10 recommendations include that CSC managers at all levels be held accountable for the failings that led to Heinz's death. Today, both CSC and the Public Safety Minister accepted Zinger's recommendations. The Heinz family is pushing for criminal charges. I'm going to fight so hard until the people responsible for causing his death are sentenced to prison as well as and see what it's like in there. The RCMP confirmed today the results of their renewed investigation are now in the hands of Crown prosecutors. Angela McIver, CBC News, Halifax. A second body has been recovered from the Rocher River in northern Alberta. RCMP say Keenan Cardinal's body was found Monday evening. He was one of four people from Fort Chippewan who went missing over a week ago. The search continues from air and underwater for the two men who are still missing. Quebecers facing flooding were asked to be patient today as the province tries to help areas that need it most. Parts of Quebec, many in the south and east, have had sudden heavy rainfalls. Combined with the spring thaw, streams and rivers are rising fast. Some of the hardest hit communities are Gatineau, Rigo, and Shawinigan. Allison Northcott is there. Swollen rivers and unusually heavy rains have left behind messes like this. Across Quebec, there have been dozens of washed out roads and flooded homes. Water is dangerously close to Carole Lapointe's home in Gatineau, and friends and family are trying to help. We had a little uh, relief for a week, but unfortunately it rained a little too much. City officials say nearly 300 homes are at risk, and some residents have been asked to evacuate. Here in Shawinigan, the problem is the St. Maurice River. Its levels are far higher than normal, and officials say the worst is yet to come. There is more rain in the forecast for this weekend, and Eloi Gauthier and Irene Jean's home is already damaged by flooding. C'est dur. C'est beaucoup. C'est beaucoup. It's hard, they say, and a lot to handle. Other neighbors are frustrated but hoping for the best. I got a problem with my house now. I'm probably going to have to spend a lot of money fixing it. And my wife and myself were stressed to the limit. He says Hydro-Quebec hasn't done enough to control the flow of water through its barges in order to protect homes. But with the amount of snow melting and rain falling, Hydro-Quebec says it's done all it can to minimize the damage. The province's public security minister toured the flooded area today, warning residents to be on alert. In Maniwaki, two schools were evacuated and residents at this long-term care home were moved out as the Gatineau River swelled. At this animal sanctuary, damaged by flooding, horses and chickens were moved to higher ground, along with two pregnant wolves about to give birth. Officials say they're monitoring water levels closely and warning residents to be ready to move quickly if necessary. Allison Northcott, CBC News, Shawinigan, Quebec. Straight ahead, the world's top hockey player out of action again. 
Sidney Crosby has crucial decisions to make. The National with Peter Mansbridge. Good evening, good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm Peter Mansbridge, and this is The National. Well, we are a long way from our usual cozy studio tonight. It's about 3,000 kilometers that way. This is the Northwest Passage. We're in a shaft of the old syndicate coal mines here in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. These are unusual surroundings for the National. We're about an hour north of Fort McMurray from Stratford, Ontario in Delta, British Columbia. From Parliament Hill in Saskatoon. Going live off the deck of an icebreaker in Vancouver. From Montreal, once again tonight, a city at the heart of a crisis in the cold. Do you worry about the ice? Yes, I do, yeah. Um, what's going to happen if it all melts, melts away? All jolly we minor men and minor men are we. They've all worked the coal mines in Cape Breton. Now they sing to preserve the heritage and the folklore of the island's mining communities. <laughs> Canada is still here tonight, but just barely. Quebecers have voted no to sovereignty. But of course, the story the whole world is watching is the historic switch to the year 2000. This is the day that Winnipeg has been waiting for worrying about, even dreading. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge from downtown Toronto. For the most part, an eerily dark Toronto. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge inside Vatican City. Good evening from the Netherlands, Baghdad. In Tiananmen Square tonight from London. In Vimy Ridge, France. From Kandahar, Afghanistan. Here in Berlin, there's another opening in the wall tonight, number 22. When the waves crashed ashore here and they didn't have far to come, there's the beach line. Our ride today is on an Israeli Air Force Black Hawk helicopter. That is the area that the suicide bombers use to get to some of their targets. Look at those. Those are the papal apartments just over on the other side. That's where the Pope lives. As night falls, we're back on the road, moving through the streets of Kandahar, and as always, on the lookout. Thanks for watching. It's a headline you've heard before, but every time it's more troubling. The biggest name in hockey, Sidney Crosby, has been sidelined with yet another concussion. And the long-term impact is unknown. Havard Gould has that. Pittsburgh. The key part of the play was over in a little more than one second. In that time, Sidney Crosby's longtime rival, Alexander Ovechkin, hits Crosby's helmet with a high stick. And then, while Crosby is falling, another player cross-checks him in the face. Oh, yeah, there's the cross-check right in the head to Sidney Crosby by Niskanen. This single image captures the worst moment. Stick and head connecting with force. Oh, boy. You don't want him hurt, ever. Immediately afterwards, Crosby is on the ice, apparently dazed. And the fears for his future begin. And Niskanen got him as he was going to the net. Are these penal For Crosby, has a history of concussions throughout his brilliant career. Crosby wasn't on the ice for practice today. The team refusing to be gloomy, saying that while Crosby is concussed and unable to play the next game tomorrow, he remains upbeat. We're, we're very optimistic, and we're and, you know we're hopeful that that we'll get him back in a timely fashion. This concussion expert says Crosby will have to be careful to make sure he is fully recovered before getting back on the ice. And hockey, being what it is, really does put your, your you at risk for a, a, another concussion in a short period of time. And we actually think that's the worst state, is to get multiple concussions over a short period of time where you haven't given yourself enough time to recover. He's been through concussions before. Hockey analyst John Shannon says at this moment, Crosby should not put the playoffs, his team, or even his career first. This is a, now starting to become a concern about Sidney Crosby, uh, the person, and the long-term ramifications of, of concussions and 
and and what he wants to do about it, whether he wants to be part of a game that is this violent at times. The most violent moments can be over in an instant, but the risk is the effects, and sometimes last a lifetime. Howard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. An ugly side of sports showed its face in Boston last night. Baltimore Orioles outfielder Adam Jones says he was the target of racial abuse while playing the Red Sox. Jones says he was taunted with racial slurs from the crowd and had a bag of peanuts thrown at him. Today, the Red Sox apologize, saying they are sickened by the conduct of an ignorant few. This isn't the first time Jones has witnessed this behavior from so-called fans. During last year's wildcard game in Toronto, Jones says he heard the same ugly word yelled from the stands. That's the same game where a beer can was thrown on the field at another Orioles player. Up next, a deeper look at our top story. We'll tackle the hard questions about our involvement in South Sudan. Do we care? Plus, a critical look at public education. All of a sudden, school choice looks a lot more like school segregation. That's later on Viewpoints. Hello there, Facebook fans, uh, Facebook Live fans. Um, we've got a four-minute break here to take your questions before we have our panel on, uh, on South Sudan. So uh, let's get right at it. Um, Johanna Morton says, I'm just curious what you think is the most important story that isn't making the cut in, a news in tonight's newscast, or perhaps what did but wasn't reported on. Well, actually, I'm going to turn this around a little bit because... In the last two nights, we have made a conscious decision to make a statement with our newscast, and that is about the situation in South Sudan. You won't see that on, uh, on any other newscast, certainly near the top of any other newscast in, in North America. But we are, we've just been there, Margaret Evans is there, as you can tell from the reporting that she did last night, tonight, and will do again tomorrow night. And we see this as an incredibly important story, and we want to put it up front at the top of our broadcast. Uh, and so usually that's a story that doesn't make our program. We've known about the situation in South Sudan. We haven't been able to get to it uh, for months. We're now there. We got in. We're telling the story, and we are placing it at the top of our broadcast. Um, Nicholas Resens asks, what do you think about what's happening in South Sudan? Well, it's appalling. Any human should find that appalling, what's happening in South Sudan. That's why we're telling the story. And in this panel, it's coming up in a couple of minutes, we'll try to discuss what perhaps we can do from this side of the world. Um, Mandy Hunt wants to know whether I think Minister Sajjan will step down. I don't know. That's, you know, his decision and his government's decision. He's under a lot of pressure right now, but so far they've been uh, standing firm on that question, apologizing for, uh, for what he did, uh, but not suggesting they'd go anywhere. Julia Landry asks, uh, have you ever been told by executives to not tell the truth on air? No, I have never been told that. Um, Joshua Chilcott asks, I'm a car buff. What kind of car do you drive? What was your first car? I drive a truck. My first car was a 1962 Chevy 2. Uh, it, it, it was a bit of a lemon. Uh, Jackson, uh, sorry, GM, but it was a long time ago. Uh, Jackson Lucas asks, how many different places have you traveled throughout your career at CBC? Uh, all continents except one. That's being Antarctica, and I still hope to get to Antarctica while I'm um, still in this world. Uh, but so far, I haven't. And, you know, many, many countries within uh, each continent. I don't have an exact number. I wish I could. On Someday I'll have to sit down and count them. Uh, Jody Ross asks, what was your very first story on CBC? Well, I was in Churchill, Manitoba, so it was either about a polar bear, the port of Churchill, um, or, or, or probably some uh, you know terrible story that happened uh, uh, in terms of a fire or a car accident. Those, but it was probably a polar bear. We had a lot of polar bear stories in Churchill. Sorry, uh, one minute. Ralph Stoker, Peter, you look good with a beard. Hey, stick around, buddy. Um, you might see that in a few months 
course, I won't be here any longer, so you'll have to see me on the street. Adam J. Walsh asks, any plans to stay in television when you retire from the CBC? Maybe. Story to come. Cindy Jean Powell asks, what was your most profound moment while reporting? What impacted you the most? I think most of us who've done the big international stories that deal with um, human suffering uh, will tell you that uh, those stories had the most profound impact. I had a number, Exodus of the Boat People from uh, Vietnam, Tsunami in uh, Southeast Asia, and this story, Sudan. Watch our panel. It's coming up in two seconds. <music> Well, you've seen Margaret Evans' reports the last two days from South Sudan and the emerging disaster unfolding there. Is there anything we can do about it? Joining us tonight, Samantha Nutt, founder of War Child Canada. Brian Stewart, former CBC foreign correspondent and the journalist who helped bring the devastating 1984 famine in Ethiopia to the world's attention. And Kennedy Jawoko, a journalism professor at Seneca College who was in South Sudan researching ways journalists cover food security. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, the basics. South Sudan is in Northeast Africa, just beside Ethiopia, where 30 years ago, Canadians and the world rallied to save thousands from starvation. The map shows South Sudan's predicament today, the worst hit areas in red. There are 11.3 million people in South Sudan. Almost half of them face hunger today. They simply do not have enough food. A million are children. A hundred thousand are at immediate risk of death. Let me say that again. A hundred thousand are at immediate risk of death. How has Canada responded? $119 million to affected countries in Northeast Africa, 37 million of that to South Sudan. The UN says more than 40 times that much is needed to avert a humanitarian disaster, and it's needed now. All right, the UN also says this is the first famine anywhere in the world in six years. So if you accept that, where do you place the major part of the blame? Is it in climate or is it the civil war that's going on, especially in South Sudan? Peter, in this situation, a famine is a catastrophe in slow motion, or at least it starts off as a catastrophe in slow motion, and several things have to go wrong at once. It's kind of the perfect storm. And so in this case, uh, it is the rise of, of instability of violence within the, that part of the world, uh, within the countries that have been affected, but also compounded by climate change, by drought, by uh, economic pressures, inflationary pressures, uh, migration and displacement, that sort of thing. And so uh, all of these things happen at the same time have led us to this unfortunate situation with now 20 million people at risk, which, as you mentioned, the United Nations has declared that to be the largest number of people at risk since World War II. So it's a, it's a really critical, critical situation. So one element needs the others as well for it to develop into this kind of situation. Exactly. And famine is not something that plagues uh, stable governments in well-functioning democracies. Brian, any disagreement there? Absolutely none. And it uh, sounds right to stress the slow motion aspect of that. We've had years of a build-up towards the catastrophe, not just in South Sudan, but the other countries mentioned, in Yemen, in Somalia, in mm -hmm. the northern east, uh, in Nigeria. Nigeria. You know, it's there. There's a, also, besides the violence, which I put down as primary, the poor governance, which is, in many cases, no government governance at all, but also economic catastrophe of enormous level. I mean, the, the death of so many commodities, the, the slow d d depression that befell the commodity market, basically left so many countries in Africa with poor exchange rates. They had to pay more money to bring food in. Inflation in parts of South Sudan, I think, is hitting 800 percent a year. How can the poor, how can the basically homeless, subsistence farmers possibly survive. Kennedy, you've been there. You've studied this situation. It, there's been a civil war there now for three years. Um, a lot of blame is being placed on, on the government in Sudan, uh, South Sudan, in allowing this to unfold the way it is. Is that fair to place that blame? Oh, 
I think that's a very fair, you know, uh, assessment from a lot of international aid organizations, but also the United Nations and other South Sudanese watchers as well. I, I think what's happening is that people are, are uh, people are running out from the brink of genocide into the arms of famine. And, and that is partly to do with the collapse of uh, good leadership. Uh, there is a, a very, I mean, when, when I first went to South Sudan um, in 2011, uh, right after independence, we already saw the cracks of uh, poor leadership and, and the joking of who you know, wanted to, uh, to, you know, to, to lead the country between the two uh, protagonists, the two men, uh, Salva Kiir, who is the president right now, and uh, his vice president, um, uh, Riek Machar. And that continued. So, you know, famine is not something that happens, just like Samantha said, in, in, in well-established democracies. Mm -hmm. So the reason it's happening in South Sudan is because uh, I think the institutions are non-existent. We, we concentrated as an international community, even in East Africa, to, uh, uh, to build a state, the notion of statecraft. And we forgot the fundamental uh, issues that were there and building the capacity of those leaders uh, to make informed, engaged, meaningful decisions that's going to lift up the standard of their people. Uh, otherwise, we're not gonna, we wouldn't be seeing uh, what's, uh, what's unfolding right now in, in that country. Sam, you're, you've got a team there now. What are they telling you? Well, I would, I would certainly agree with that. And I would add to that, that on, on top of the government in many instances being implicated in, in this violence and in some of the atrocities uh, that are taking place, and including things like recruitment of, of child soldiers, for example, uh, rape and abuse of women, and it, in addition to those accusations, this is a government that also has impeded aid efforts, humanitarian efforts, at pretty much every turn. And so it is making it extremely difficult for aid organizations such as War Child and many others that are on the ground to just do our jobs. You know, if, it, if we were able to get access to populations in need, if we were able to ensure that farmers had the tools and the inputs that they needed to be able to to, to farm the land, to be able to provide for themselves and provide for their families. I mean, it's like a, it's, 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 it's this massive storm that's coming your way and you know it's going to hit and you know it's going to be absolutely devastating. And unfortunately, despite all of the alarm bells that are going off, you can feel absolutely powerless to do anything about it. And that's something that every aid organization on the ground in South Sudan right now is facing. And powerless in some ways to get the, the message out of what's happening there. I mean, I had... Um, Stephanie Jenzer, Margaret Evans' producer, talking to me on the weekend and Richard Devey, the cameraman, saying what they'd just witnessed and what they'd seen reminded me of the talks we used to have when you were in Ethiopia, had to be brought to the attention of the world. The question is, who's listening? I mean, the, the UN says they need four and a half billion dollars to confront this situation. They're nowhere near that. No. And they can't seem to get anyone to listen. Here's the real scary thing about it that's been worrying me for many years now. I think we're in a phase in the world where the vortex of ever increasing news stories and crises and real crises and of, con of corruption and c conflict is simply overwhelming. It's overwhelming, in many cases, governments and the overwhelming aid agencies. It's overwhelming the media. And I think it's starting to overwhelm the attention spans of everybody. Uh, every week we're hearing new crises. And the other thing is, at this time of big stories and crises, everybody's got their own parochial concerns now. In North America, elections, the Trump phenomena. In Europe, elections, the refugee crisis counterterrorism all of these are taking up more and more of the attention of the world and it's distracting attention from a crisis that is so vast that 20 million people are at risk of death through famine malnutrition and disease and basically uh, it's just one more sound up there in the ether that people aren't hearing clearly and it's just getting worse and worse and i don't know yet what the answer to it is Kennedy, how do you feel about that? I, I think the answer, um, you know, uh, if I may, could also be in um, looking at, you know, how South Sudanese journalists are telling their own stories as well. Mm -hmm. So with the work that I did uh, starting in uh, 2013, um, you know, I, I went to South Sudan with, this, with the support of... Um, uh, of, of John Hondrick of the Toronto Star. Mm -hmm. And he funded my trip there to conduct this research to look at 
you know, food security issues. And I came back with a report. I've developed a prototype uh, that allows for some kind of a mechanism to effectively report on food security issues and hunger and famine and all the, uh, um, you know, the, the evils that were unfolding uh, in South Sudan. And, and so what I found there was that a lot of young South Sudanese journalists want to tell their stories. They want to get their stories out. And they have tapped into, um, you know, some of them have tapped into uh, the new wave of, um, you know, digital uh, liberation tools, Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, Facebook, and all the, uh, you know, um, uh, WhatsApp, and all, you know, all the gadgets, the tools that we have. And, and that in some, t in some ways is getting the stories out, but it's not really reaching, I believe, uh, the, the ears that, has, that, you know, uh, that are supposed to make those critical decisions, whether it's in Ottawa or in Washington or in London, Paris, all these major Western cities uh, that, uh, that need to hear what's going on in, in, in South Sudan. So training South Sudanese journalists is going to be critical to uh, the gap that we have right now in terms of uh, you know, the disconnect, if you like, right. between the stories that are getting out and what uh, is being received in uh, Western capitals. Sam? Uh, I certainly agree with that, and I think it is going to take a monumental uh, political, global political effort to react to this crisis. And uh, and it, when do we reach the tipping point on that? Uh, it would seem to be that early warnings are not sufficient. We know 100,000 children are immediately at risk. We know millions more are at, uh, at, at serious risk, serious threat in terms of their health and well-being. Um, are we going to have to get to another situation like the Ethiopian famine, where the images are so overwhelming and incontrovertible that we are compelled to do the right thing as an international community? Famine is preventable, and it's uh, often this kind of patchworky approach that, that can, in some instances, and this over-reliance on, on food aid and that kind of thing that doesn't take a long-term view of these challenges that can inadvertently, unfortunately, make it worse. You know, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, we knew that those images in Ethiopia of dying children and just ghastly images, we knew that if the world waited to see things like that again, it would be far too late because when a famine strikes, it's already a massive failure. You can rush in and try and, and, and help a famine, but basically when they're dying in those numbers, it's it, people have reacted too late. I think also today there's a, a numbing of the visual aspect. We see so many catastrophes, so many cor corpses over the years. The other thing is I think there is something I call deadly defeatism. I think countries are getting weary of struggles that don't seem to end. That's so depressing, though. It is. Well, it's that. not only depressing, it's incredibly dangerous. We can't allow defeatism to take hold. But, you know, you know many of these countries have been basically failed states. There are 50 mm -hmm. failing and failed states in the world. Mm -hmm. Many of them in failed states now for 20, 30 years. And when, when Europeans or North Americans look and see no real crisis coming back again, they start to feel defeatist, that they can really affect change all that much. That's a disastrous point of view. You know, um, Ethiopia proved that uh, proved uh, this theory isn't always the case, but there is the belief by some that when it's Africa and we're talking about these kind of situations that you can't raise you can't raise the, the money aid, you can't raise the food aid, and you can't raise awareness of governments. You were in a, working in Africa all the time. Yeah, is, that, is that the case? For, I've been working on these kinds of issues and going in and out of Africa, certainly war zones, for the last 25 years. And uh, I started in Somalia during the famine, and here we are 25 years later facing a similar, a similar situation. Um, and it is intensely frustrating. But I actually d genuinely believe that if we can mobilize public attention, if we can get governments to take notice, if we can uh, be smart about the early warning system and what kinds of interventions work, if governments are willing to respond, if individual Canadians are willing to respond, that, that alternatives do exist and that we actually can uh, mm -hmm. find a, a way through this. But it takes diplomatic effort and energy, it takes financial effort and energy, and it takes a, a, a public commitment to, to engaging and, and a sense of, of social responsibility around that. And I, and I do think Canadians are generous when it comes to that, uh, but sometimes it takes encouragement. And, uh, and being on the ground and helping to report on it makes a big difference there. I've only got 30 seconds left. Kennedy, give us the closing thought here. I, I strongly believe that um, 
the international community has the responsibility to protect South Sudanese uh, citizens from Fabian and this barbarity that is going on in the context of you know civilians being killed indiscriminately and and Canada has a role here not just a moral obligation but also a self-interest obligation uh, to intervene in, uh, in in South Sudan whether uh, I don't know how that's gonna what shape it's gonna take but I, I think there needs to be some clear message coming out from Ottawa all right well, thank you all good discussion and I'm sure we'll have more of them in the uh, in the next little while now, stay tuned for viewpoints and a change of topic here. Is public education failing in its promise of equal opportunity? First, though, let's check the day's business numbers. The TSX rose by 44 points. The dollar was down three tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow rose 36 points. The price of oil fell 76 cents a barrel. The people of Thomasville, Georgia, have stopped counting how often it comes. They just know it does. It's that train, the one carrying the most galling of cargoes. Canadian softwood lumber, Newfoundland, Quebec, British Columbia's best. Each plank more salt in the very deep wound of Bob Balfour. Well, it doesn't feel very good to see the tracks fill with Canadian lumber. We know it's overwhelming the country. In that rail yard shadow, three generations of Bob Balfour's have cut southern pine here. But the mill's been silent for months. No match, the argument goes, for Canada. We know it's taking our markets away from us. They can undersell uh, southern yellow pine all over the United States. There's no way that we can compete with Canada. Here, in the land of the southern pine, that's a little hard to take. Georgia is the largest lumber products manufacturer in the entire United States, but that doesn't mean its own southern pine rules this place. Canadian softwood, this lumber right here, now takes a third of the market. Ideal for the construction industry, Canadian softwood is lighter, easier to pound nails into, cheaper. And that's always frustrated the U.S. mill owners. Decades of trade battles were supposed to end with a deal negotiated in 1996 that restricts the export of Canadian softwood lumber. U.S. mill owners say it didn't protect them enough, point out that three major Georgia mills have closed in the last year. Many more, like Metcalf Lumber, are on the brink. Limping along, the owner says, in hope that when the current agreement ends on March 31st, something stricter will replace it. Canadians want just the opposite, complete free trade in softwood. That makes P.W. Bryant I shudder. I think the situation only worsens. Yeah, probably we'll, we'll have to shut down. Canadian mills are suffering too, but there's a perception here that Canada has an unbeatable edge partly because of the low Canadian dollar, partly because many Canadian mills are more modern, more efficient. But the most unfair advantage, say the Americans, is how little Canadians pay for timber. Where U.S. mills must bid for wood on the open market, Canadians buy it from government-owned land at much cheaper prices. An illegal subsidy, the Americans scream. Don't bother trying to remind anyone here that that's never been proven. I don't think they're as justified as our plight. I'm telling you, the lumber industry in the United States is in dire straits. I mean, this is the worst. I've been in it 40 years, I've never seen it like this. Complex trade issues that deep in the southern woods boil down to one clear reality. It's really hurt our business. You know, I don't have any problem with them shipping it in here, but they should tax it accordingly. an entire industry on the edge. Convinced Canada is driving it into oblivion. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, Thomasville, Georgia. My name is Rachel Giza. 
I'm a journalist. I write about gender and politics in parenting. And I want to talk to you about segregation in our schools. As a kid growing up in Canada in the 1980s, I didn't choose what public school to go to. Like every other kid I knew, I just went to the one in my neighborhood. Now I'm a parent with a child in public school and the options are endless. There's French immersion, alternative schools, gifted and international baccalaureate programs, there's specialized arts and sports streams, there's schools devoted to STEM subjects. There's just so much choice and choice is great, right? Well, that depends on who you ask, and it also depends on whether your kid is benefiting or being excluded. Because the rise in school choice has created a two-tiered system. And the very same public school system that was meant to give all kids the same educational opportunities is now being gamed by parents with the most advantages to give their kids a private school experience within the public one. Take Toronto. It has one of the most diverse and multicultural school districts in the world but its public schools are increasingly separated by race and income. The majority of children in specialized programs like French immersion are white and from high income families. More than half the kids in gifted programs come from the wealthiest families, while only 9% of gifted stream kids come from the poorest ones. And at Toronto's four arts high schools, 67% of students entering grade nine are white, and most of the kids have parents with university degrees. All of a sudden, school choice looks a lot more like school segregation, with kids of color, immigrant kids, poor kids, and kids with disabilities being left behind. So how did this happen? Well, declining enrollment drove a lot of school boards to offer boutique programs to retain white and middle class families. And school choice caught on. And no wonder, kids in these programs thrive. They get good grades and they stay in school. So now provinces like Alberta allow kids to choose whichever school in their board they like. Alberta also pays for non-government run schools and for homeschooling. Now in theory, school choice could benefit poor kids, newcomer kids, and racialized kids too. But statistically, it doesn't. It's wealthier, whiter parents who have been more effective lobbying to get their kids into these enriched programs. And they're also the ones flocking to gentrifying neighborhoods with desirable public schools. Local public schools are one of the few places where people of all backgrounds can come together. And they should be places where every kid gets the best education we can offer. There's nothing wrong with specialized programs. They just shouldn't be so special. Arts and science, languages and sports shouldn't be treated as enrichments for some kids. They should be offered to all kids. For The National, I'm Rachel Giza. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, gratitude is a central element of the refugee story. But is there a point when being grateful warps into a never-ending expectation that becomes toxic? That story on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. Tomorrow, Coca-Cola Company will tell a thirsty world it's putting a smoother, sweeter taste into the most instantly recognizable bottle in the world. This has got to be the boldest consumer product move of any kind, of any stripe, since Eve started to hand out apples. Here they drag out all the hoopla, thinking that they're going to war against the arch-rival Pepsi. But it turns out they've picked a fight in their own backyard with their best friends. I can't tell the difference between the new taste of Coke and the old taste of Pepsi. Why are you upset about it? My oldest daughter is 22. Her first word was Coke. Her second oh, word was mommy. What? For decades, Coke has stayed on top by being cautious and conservative. Lately, though, Pepsi is growing faster than Coke. The Pepsi challenge is clearly hurting. Oh, we made our choice. Make it a Pepsi. Pepsi has captured a, uh, a young, hip positioning that Coke, by nature of its corporate culture, is not really able to understand yet. I put a Pepsi in the bowl, and that choice is not for you. Hey. It must be every young boy's fantasy to turn around and see Michael Jackson. I mean, how wonderful. The Coca-Cola Company is bringing back the real thing. For weeks, the company has been hyping the taste of its new formula Coke. But today, it announced it's going to start selling the old Coke again under a new name. 
We're bringing it back. The original taste of Coca-Cola returns as Coca-Cola Classic. We have booster ignition and liftoff. When the shuttle Challenger blasts off tomorrow, it will begin a new space race. On board will be two specially designed soft drink cans, one from Coke, the other from Pepsi, allowing astronauts to drink a carbonated beverage in the weightlessness of space for the first time. Yes, it's the Cola Wars in action. The supermarket shelf is the front line in the Cola War. Pepsi and Coke slugging it out in the world's longest running business battle. National. The National. Tonight. In New York, it didn't take long for the sign to go up. Seven Tony Award nominations, including Best Musical, for the popular Canadian production that just hit Broadway in March, Come From Away. It's good to talk about human kindness and about coming together and to overcoming division and to see everyone um, celebrating that. It's, uh, it's amazing. And celebrating the work that we've been, everyone on our show has been working on for years. It's, it's incredible. The husband and wife team are also nominated for Best Book as well as Original Score. And the show is up for Best Direction, Lighting, Choreography, plus a nod for acting as well. The show takes place in Gander, Newfoundland, where they celebrated the nomination today. But you might not know the production began as a workshop at an Ontario college. And as Stephanie Van Campen tells us, there were celebrations there as well. The nominees for Best Musical are Come From Away. Far from the bright lights of Broadway, but the excitement just as palpable on the campus of Sheridan College near Toronto. I'm overwhelmed and it's surreal, but at the same time, I, I'm not surprised. Like I knew it was going to happen. These alumni were the first to perform Come From Away five years ago. We both kind of looked at each other like right after singing the opening number and we just went, oh, this Oh, this show's going to be on Broadway. The show was born out of the Canadian Music Theatre Project at Sheridan, which pairs fourth-year performing arts students with professional writers who want to develop new musicals. Five days! Nineteen animals! And seven thousand strays! This one, about a small town in Newfoundland that welcomed the world after the 9-11 attack stranded thousands of airline passengers. The idea of turning that story into a musical belonged to producer and associate dean Michael Rubinoff. We have a very quiet patriotism as Canadians and this was an event that, that you just wanted to say loudly, this makes me so proud to be a Canadian. But at first there wasn't much interest. And I took the, the idea to several writers who didn't think it was a good idea. But writers Irene Sankoff and David Hine saw the potential. The school became a testing ground, the students guinea pigs, an experiment with unforeseeable results. Tonight we honor what was last, but we also commemorate what we found. Come From Away became one of only five Canadian musicals to ever make it to Broadway. The success has unleashed a flood of requests from writers hoping to have Sheridan students test out their musicals. 21st century and sparked more interest in musical theatre across Canada. The 
the success of Come From Away and a couple of other musicals that have sort of burbled up over the past years have uh, reignited an interest in musical theatre in Canada and we see more infrastructure developing at the theatre companies across the, the country. The nominations might be the first ever for a school and producers here at Sheridan hope it's not the last. The school continues to develop new musicals, searching for the next runaway hit. Stephanie Van Campen, CBC News, Oakville. That's the National this Tuesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.